Good morning, this is Clive Tintmason of the Early Music Studio Workshop. I've been working on this lute now for some time. I've made a couple of videos about making the mold, putting ribs on the lute, putting the first rib on, and it occurred to me that it might be an interesting uh, exposition to talk a little bit about flatback lutes in general and uh, how they were often, they often began as bass lutes, around, made around 1580 to 1600, and then later were converted into Baroque lutes by 18th century lute makers, especially German and uh, in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Uh, you couldn't really have a better demonstration of how the lute back is flattened than by looking at these two templates. You can easily see that the, uh, the, the one in the front here, this is the spine profile, and then the one in the back, that is the profile of the, the soundboard. So you can see just how flattened these lutes are. The idea here is to reduce the volume of the interior of the lute in such a way as to increase the bass response. And I'm going to try and demonstrate that in the studio. Here I am in my studio today and I'm going to be talking a little bit about how these bass lutes uh, made in the early 1600s or the late 1500s were later converted by 18th century lute makers into 13 corks lutes and why that might have been an attractive uh, proposition for them. First of all, of course, they had to have a supply of the lutes, and I think that one of the reasons may be that um, because they were made in chests or sets, consorts, uh, just like vials and recorders, um, they were made in groups of four, so they would have a bass lute, an alto lute, uh, a, a bass lute, tenor lute, um, alto and soprano lute, and you would simply sit around your table with a table book or with park books and play madrigals or, or other uh, vocal pieces. Each person in the family were, in the ensemble would take one part according to their ability. They might even have played from tablature or they might easily, you could easily learn to read at these different pitches. It's not that difficult. Um, so why are these lutes so interesting and so extraordinary? Um, so the, the idea of the, of the flattening of the back is one of the most important characteristics the, by flattening the back, you can see there's a big difference in the profile if I do it, show it that way or if I show it that way. Um, the flattening of the back reduces the cavity, the resonance cavity, reduces the air mass, the volume. And um, by having a very large soundboard, a, a very large driver is resonating over a fairly small space. So this gives the bass a certain tremendous prominence and uh, fe it features it quite strongly, and of course that's a natural thing. Also, ergonomically, it's much easier to hold, otherwise the lute would, I would be back here trying to hold it. And if you've ever tried to play a fiorbo, you know that as they get larger, they're uh, quite a bit more difficult to play. So uh, this is the, the flattening of the back, and the balance between the bass and the treble is one of the main musical features of these instruments, and I'm going to try and show that to you or demonstrate it by playing this little piece that I've arranged. It's called Daphne, and it's a piece from around 7, 1600, um, originally published in, a, in Dutch books, um, and it's a, a, for flute or recorder. So it, I think it shows very well how the lute can be adapted to solo music, this, this bass lute can be adapted to solo music, and why it proved attractive to later makers uh, because of the preservation feature, that they were not played as much as the other lutes, therefore still existed, and haven't been played into dust, and also that they presented them with the possibility of um, taking the lute and renovating it and changing it into a, a making it more contemporary in, in its disposition. So here's a little piece of Daphne. <laughs> Thank you. 
tried to show with that little reprise at the end how well the lute sounds in, in its tenor register, although that's actually the bass, let's put it be, to be precise, and, um, and how well the melody and the bass balance one another, even though these bass notes are very prominent, and I wouldn't say loud exactly, because the word loud and lute can sure, surely never exist in the same sentence. So I think this is one reason why these makers were attracted to these lutes, because of their amazing bass response. Uh, now I have a, a lute which is, I, I've made uh, from a drawing, and the drawing is of a lute, in, uh, a Venetian lute made by a German craftsman, Pietro Reilich, or Peter Reilich. Uh, and it's quite an amazing lute in many ways. First of all, it's not a bass lute, and it has a very short string length. It's only 62, around 62 centimeters. And it's an 11 course lute now, and uh, it might have been in, in its, because the marks on the soundboard show it might have been a 10 course lute, it might even have been a liuto at at one time. It's hard to tell what sort of tribulations these old lutes have gone through before they reach their final form before somebody um, preserved them in, their, in the condition that they were in. This lute has 15 ribs, shaded U in this case, and um, it, it also is very flat-backed. Now what uh, attracted me to this lute was that I, I saw in um, Denis Gautier's Pièce de Lute, uh, the full title is Livre de, tab Livre de Tablature des Pièces de Lute sur plusieurs différents modes. So several different modes, or several different keys. And the, um, the frontispiece of the second book of this set contain, has a picture of a, of a lute, which is so much like this, it's really quite striking, rather than the elongated bass lutes that you normally, these sort of long fry body lutes that you normally see people using for French Baroque music. This lute is not like that at all. And um, it lends itself extremely well to this music, which is from the sort of post-1650s period. And the, uh, this book, I think, was published in 1682, but I think it's music that was written uh, quite a bit earlier than that. And it's been, he, he's waited until the end, more or less the end of his life to publish the music, and that's often the case with some of these lute books. Um, so the, the feature that I'm interested in here is the balance between the bass, which is, uh, in this case, I have all gut strings. So. Not, not exactly prominent sound, but it's, the thing about the, the bass, these lutes in the bass, is that they balance very well with the treble. And I, I, had, I think there's certain features of this music, which um, you'll see, I called it the broken bass line, in which the, the, um, the composer has taken trouble to keep uh, the two registers of the bass separate. So instead of having progressions that go down by step or some other rather continuous movement. Quite often you'll see that the tenor breaks off and suddenly goes into the bass and then it goes back to the tenor and goes back to the bass. And the thumb is making these kind of typical movements that one sees in French lute music almost exclusively. So this is one of the features that I'm looking for in this particular music. So I'm going to play this little piece almost at the beginning on page eight of this book, uh, the second piece in the book actually. In G major, it's called Pavan ou Tombeau de Monsieur Raquette. It's a very emotional piece. Obviously, Monsieur Raquette was an important man, it meant a lot to Denis because he wrote a really a great masterpiece, in my opinion. So, this is how it sounds when played on this uh, flat backed, multi rib, short string length lute of the around 1640. <laughs> Thank you. 
There's another section to this piece, but I think that this last uh, section particularly well demonstrates what I'm... You, you notice that there, there's a, a high note, and then... And then that thumb... executes an entire line uh, on, the, on the middle courses a little bit, and then uh, later on, there's this really, uh, I think, startling move on this in this composer's music. And then bass, and then thumb plays way down here. Now he doesn't have to use the thumb in this way. This is just a personal choice. And I think it's, it shows something about the way the lute responds that it, uh, the, the, the tenor and the alto can kind of have a bit of a dialogue. It's a kind of contrapuntal dialogue um, with bass notes punctuating it. And I think this is one of the special features of this kind of lute and one of the reasons why he chose to use these lutes rather than longer, more, maybe more extroverted sounding lutes that were a little bit louder. Um, so th I think this is a, a really interesting uh, stop on the way, and I'm going to show you how Weiss copied this very same feature of Gautier's music almost a century later. Here in my, I'm in my studio, and I've got... Uh, here, uh, continuing the discussion about lutes with flattened backs and how earlier lutes were dis converted by luthiers of the 18th century into what we now call Baroque lutes. They didn't call them lutes, that of course, that's our term. This instrument was built for me by Robert Lundberg in 1978. And um, when I ordered it, I didn't really specify what sort of lute I was interested in or what I wanted. And I certainly did not have any idea that Mr. Lundberg had done so much research on the conversions of later luthiers using material from the early 17th century. So this particular lute was modeled in a lute by Thomas Edlinger of Prague, who rebuilt bass lutes with their typical Venetian flattened backs into 13-course lutes in the later 1720s. There are several examples of these lutes by Edlinger. And he used earlier Italian soundboards that would command, he probably thought they would command higher prices. A lot of people have thought that he was making fakes, and I, I don't really agree with that. I think he just was using the materials that he had at hand and, uh, you know, kind of meeting the demands of a market. This particular lute has 13 ribs of maple. That would be considered a broad rib lute, and if you're, unless you're making, uh, so I said 13, I meant 11 ribs, of course. Um, and it has the triple rows, and uh, it's got 13 courses, and so rather than simply having a rider attached to the head here, it, it's a very interesting structure because a lot of the earliest 13 course lutes would simply take a, this piece of wood carved and then glue it onto the 11 course lute peg box. But this particular lute, the uh, side of the peg box is actually, uh, this, this part of the peg box and then the side here, it's actually one piece. So it's obvious that the lute was designed from the beginning as a 13-course lute. I think this is an important detail. This is a remarkable instrument with a prominent bass and equally strong treble and mid-range. You never have the impression that the treble and the bass don't match up somehow, and I've certainly uh, seen lots of lutes that are like that. So the, there is evidence about what they thought about these kind of lutes, and uh, contemporary writers did write about them. So I've got two little excerpts that I'd like to talk about here. The lutenist and composer Ernst Gottlieb Baron, who wrote an important treatise on the history of the lute in 1727, made the following remark about flattened lutes in his book. So I have a translation here by um, Don, Douglas Alton Smith, and the book was, this translation was published in 1976. I'm going to read this little excerpt from the chapter 7 about famous lute makers and their work. And the virtue of a lute, he says, the virtue of a lute. Although all this may well be true, and he's talking about using different uh, kinds of woods for the back, it is nonetheless merely incidental for a good sound, that is, the, what the wood of the back is, for the essence depends entirely on the luthier. He knows that the appropriate mathematical proportions 
so that the cavities, height, length, depth, and width fit together uniformly. The uniformity, and here he used the word égalité, French, was often used by 18th century German writers to indicate erudition. This uniformity, égalité, is the reason that an instrument, whether it be of Italian, German, or French wood, sounds good. Thus the lutes that are too deep in the lower part of the body, like a sack, as it were, and have small rosettes or resonance holes, are worth little or nothing. But when the lutes are made shallow and have large rosettes, the tone is stout and strong and projects well into the distance. So he's clearly making a, a value judgment about that, and of course it's only a one, one person's opinion. Um, so he did seem to prefer, and elsewhere in the article he writes that he prefers wide rib lutes over multi-rib lutes. And uh, of course multi-rib lutes were more common in the early 17th century. His preference is confirmed by some of the collections of lutes now in Eastern Europe, I'm thinking particularly of the Lobkowitz collection. Um, so Robert Lundberg thought that there was a strong connection to these lutes, even suggesting that on the trips that Weiss made to Prague, he was in contact with Edlinger and possibly picking up lutes made by him, although there doesn't appear to be any direct evidence of that. It's known from the British Museum manuscript that around 1718 to 19, Weiss added two courses to the 11 course lutes then prevalent and began to revise some of his earlier pieces by transposing the notes down. You can quickly, clearly see in the manuscript he scratched out certain notes and put them in the lower octave because he was accommodating a new lute, in, in effect. There's also a famous remark by Mattison, an 18th century German writer on music, quoting a letter that Weiss supposedly wrote to him. Once again, this is, would have to be regarded as hearsay evidence because it's third person. Weiss apparently wrote to Mattison, I have adapted one of my instruments for accompaniment in the orchestra and in church. It has the size, length, power, and resonance of a veritable theorbo, and has the same effect, only the tuning is different. I would interpret this remark to mean that Weiss might have preferred this kind of lute over the theorbo lutes, which greatly increased the bass response. I am suggesting that he preferred them because of musical reasons mentioned by Baron. It is something I've talked about in this video, which Baron called égalité, that is the overall balance of the instrument and the way the bass, middle, courses, and treble work together to create a whole instrument. So I'm going to demonstrate, I'm going to try and demonstrate this principle of balance um, and the way that Weiss may have left traces of his preference for these kind of lutes in his pieces. Um, there's a paysan from one of the sonatas in C major, and it's a character piece in the Gallant style, a bourre, which has pastoral references. So I'm, what I mean by that is it evokes the picture of shepherds and sheep and woodwind instruments, flutes, and so on, and uh, possibly bagpipes. This is a common kind of piece that they borrowed the idea from the French. Uh, there's a particular treatment of the bass strings in this piece, which I, I, I'm going to focus attention on. In one section, you can hear the same technique that Gautier used, having the thumb alternate in the middle range and the bass in quick succession. I think this is evidence of the preference for this type of lute, and the passage would make less sense on a lute with longer bass strings because of a loss of clarity. <laughs>
So here's the passage I'd like to point out. Uh, there's actually two little passages here that I think uh, are of interest, particularly in my, uh, in my essay that I've been attempting to show how Weiss used the lute and why he particularly liked these kind of lutes. Uh, this passage right here, where he's got a note in the tenor, first of all there's and then the thumb in the set up a dialogue there between the tenor and the bass, so, but you can hear that it has a very clear effect on the dynamic um, that the lute is able to bring to the piece. So um, when it's played in the bass, it's considerably more penetrating and louder. That's just because of the way the, uh, this type of lute responds. Um, and then at the end of the piece, he's got a, a, a very interesting passage, which is kind of the point of the paysan, and that is a reference to uh, a kind of countrified ideal, um, peasants and woodwind instruments and, you know, shepherds and sheep and all that sort of stuff they like to play around with then. Um, and that, it, we, we got a little thing here where it's... Um, you know, I, I feel that if you play this passage on, a, on a, one of these uh, arch lute or um, on a a Theorbo type of German style lute, the swan neck lute, whatever you want to call that instrument, um, you'll find that this passage doesn't really sound, it sounds kind of muddy, it's not very clear. So this is, um, th I think this is a trace of showing that Weiss preferred lutes over these Theorbo type instruments for solo music. So finally, I, I picked the lute up uh, at the airport and um, when I took it out, I, I couldn't believe, I thought it looked like a giant tablespoon or something, or a soup spoon. I, I'd never seen a lot, anything like that before. I was used to Renaissance instruments that, that smaller and uh, deeper bodies and so on. So, um, Mr. Lundberg wrote me a letter with the lute, and uh, it said something like this, that he felt that when people would hear these kind of lutes, they would, they would change their expectations of the potential of the Baroque lute. And in saying that, I think he was absolutely right.